This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by L. Ryder Haggard Chapter 18 We Abandon Hope I can give no adequate description of the horrors of the night which followed. Mercifully, they were to some extent mitigated by sleep, for even in such a position as ours, wearied nature will sometimes assert itself. But I, at any rate, found it impossible to sleep much. Putting aside the terrifying thought of our impending doom, for the bravest man on earth might well quail from such a fate as awaited us, and I never made any pretensions to be brave. The silence itself was too great to allow of it. Reader, you may have lain awake at night and thought the quiet oppressive, but I say with confidence that you can have no idea what a vivid, tangible thing is perfect stillness. On the surface of the earth there is always some sound or motion, and though it may in itself be imperceptible, yet it deadens the sharp edge of absolute silence. But here there was none. We were buried in the bowels of a huge snow-clad peak. Thousands of feet above us the fresh air rushed over the white snow, but no sound of it reached us. We were separated by a long tunnel and five feet of rock, even from the awful chamber of the dead, and the dead make no noise. Did we not know it who lay by poor Fulata's side? The crashing of all the artillery of earth and heaven could not have come to our ears in our living tomb. We were cut off from every echo of the world. We were as men already in the grave. Then the irony of the situation forced itself upon me. There around us lay treasures enough to pay off a moderate national debt or to build a fleet of ironclads, and yet we would have bartered them all gladly for the faintest chance of escape. Soon, doubtless, we would be rejoiced to exchange them for a bite of food or a cup of water and after that even for the privilege of a speedy close to our sufferings. Truly wealth, which men spend their lives in acquiring, is a valueless thing at the last. And so the night wore on. Good, said Sir Henry's voice at last, and it sounded awful in the intense stillness. How many matches have you in the box? Eight, Curtis. Strike one, then, and let us see the time. He did so, and in contrast to the dense darkness, the flame nearly blinded us. It was five o'clock by my watch. The beautiful dawn was now blushing on the snow wreaths far over our heads, and the breeze would be stirring the night mists in the hollows. We had better eat something and keep up our strength, I suggested. What is the good of eating, answered Good. The sooner we die and get it over with, the better. While there is life, there is hope, said Sir Henry. Accordingly, we ate and sipped some water, and another period of time elapsed. Then Sir Henry suggested that it might be well to get as near the door as possible, and hello, on the faint chance of somebody catching a sound outside. Accordingly, Good, who from long practice at sea has a fine piercing note, groped his way down the passage and set to work. I must say that he made a most diabolical noise. I never heard such yells, but it might have been a mosquito buzzing for all the effect they produced. After a while he gave it up and came back very thirsty and had to drink. Then we stopped yelling as it encroached on the supply of water. So we sat down once more against the chests of useless diamonds 
in that dreaded inaction, which is one of the hardest circumstances of our fate. And I am bound to say that, for my part, I gave way in despair. Laying my head against Sir Henry's broad shoulder, I burst into tears. And I think that I heard Good gulping away on the other side, and swearing hoarsely at himself for doing it. Ah, how good and brave that great man was! Had we been two frightened children, and he our nurse, he could not have treated us more tenderly. Forgetting his own share of miseries, he did all he could to soothe our broken nerves, telling stories of men who had been in somewhat similar circumstances and miraculously escaped. And when these failed to cheer us, pointing out how, after all, it was only anticipating an end, which must come to us all, that it would soon be over, and that death from exhaustion was a merciful one, which is not true. Then, in a diffident sort of way, as once before I had heard him do, he suggested that we should throw ourselves on the mercy of a higher power, which for my part I did with great vigor. His is a beautiful character, very quiet, but very strong. And so somehow the day went as the night had gone, if indeed one can use these terms when all was densest night. And when I lit a match to see the time, it was seven o'clock. Once more we ate and drank, and as we did so, an idea occurred to me. How is it said I, that the air in this place keeps fresh. It is thick and heavy, but it is perfectly fresh. Good heavens, said Good, starting up. I never thought of that. It can't come through the stone door, for it's airtight, if ever a door was. It must come from somewhere. If there were no current of air in the place, we should have been stifled or poisoned when we first came in. Let us have a look. It was wonderful what a change this mere spark of hope wrought in us. In a moment we were all three groping about on our hands and knees, feeling for the slightest indication of a draft. Presently my ardor received a check. I put my hand on something cold. It was dead Fulata's face. For an hour or more, we went on feeling about, till at last Sir Henry and I gave it up in despair, having been considerably hurt by constantly knocking our heads against tusks, chests, and the sides of the chamber. But Good still persevered, saying, with an approach to cheerfulness, that it was better than doing nothing. "'I say, you fellows,' he said presently, in a constrained sort of voice, Come here. Needless to say, we scrambled towards him quickly enough. Quartermain, put your hand here where mine is. Now, do you feel anything? I think I feel air coming up. Now listen. He rose and stamped upon the place, and a flame of hope shot up in our hearts. It rang hollow. With trembling hands I lit a match. I had only three left, and we saw we were in the angle of the far corner of the chamber, a fact that accounted for our not having noticed the hollow sound of the place during our former exhaustive examination. As the match burnt, we scrutinized the spot. There was a join in the solid rock floor, and, great heavens, there, let in level with the rock, was a stone ring. We said no word. We were too excited, and our hearts beat too wildly with hope to allow us to speak. Good had a knife, at the back of which was one of those hooks that are made to extract stones from horses' hooves. He opened it and scratched round the ring with it. Finally, he worked it under and levered away gently for fear of breaking the hook. The ring began to move. 
Being of stone, it had not rusted fast in all the centuries it had lain there, as would have been the case had it been of iron. Presently it was upright. Then he thrust his hands into it and tugged with all his force, but nothing budged. Let me try, I said impatiently, for the situation of the stone, right in the angle of the corner, was such that it was impossible for two to pull at once. I took hold and strained away, but no results. Then Sir Henry tried and failed. Taking the hook again, Good scratched all around the crack where we felt the air coming up. Now, Curtis, he said, tackle on and put your back into it. You are as strong as two. Stop. And he took off a stout black silk handkerchief, which, true to his habits of neatness, he still wore, and ran it through the ring. Quartermain, get Curtis round the middle and pull for dear life when I give the word. Now! Sir Henry put out all his enormous strength, and Good and I did the same, with such power as nature had given us. Heave! Heave! It's giving! gasped Sir Henry, and I heard the muscles of his great back cracking. Suddenly there was a grating sound, then a rush of air, and we were all on our backs on the floor with a heavy flagstone upon the top of us. Sir Henry's strength had done it, and never did muscular power stand a man in better stead. Light a match, Quartermain, he said, so soon as we had picked ourselves up and got our breath. Carefully now. I did so, and there before us, heaven be praised, was the first step of a stone stair. Now what is to be done? asked Good. Follow the stair, of course, and trust to Providence. Stop, said Sir Henry. Quartermain, get the bit of biltong and the water that are left. We may want them. I went, creeping back to our place by the chests for that purpose. And as I was coming away, an idea struck me. We had not thought much of the diamonds for the last twenty-four hours or so. Indeed, the very idea of diamonds was nauseous, seeing what they had entailed upon us. But, reflected I, I may as well pocket some, just in case we should ever get out of this ghastly hole. So I just put my fist into the first chest, and filled all the available pockets of my old shooting coat and trousers, topping up, this was a happy thought, with a few handfuls of big ones from the third chest. Also, by an afterthought, I stuffed Fulata's basket, which, except for one water gourd and a little biltong, was empty now with great quantities of the stones. I say, you fellows, I sang out, won't you take some diamonds with you? I filled my pockets and the basket. Oh, come on, Quartermain, and hang the diamonds, said Sir Henry. I hope that I may never see another. As for good, he made no answer. He was, I think, taking his last farewell of all that was left of the poor girl who had loved him so well. And curiously as it may seem to you, my reader, sitting at home at ease and reflecting on the vast, indeed the immeasurable, wealth which we were thus abandoning, I can assure you that if you had passed some twenty-eight hours with next to nothing to eat and drink in that place, you would not have cared to cumber yourself with diamonds whilst plunging down into the unknown bowels of the earth in the wild hope of escape from an agonizing death. If from the habits of a lifetime it had not become a sort of second nature with me never to leave anything worth having behind, if there was the slightest chance of my being able to carry it away, I am sure that I should not have bothered to fill my pockets and that basket. Come on, Quartermain, repeated Sir Henry, who was already standing on the first step of the stone stair. Steady, I will go first. Mind where you put your feet. There may be some awful hole underneath, I answered. Much more likely to be another room, said Sir Henry, while he descended slowly, counting the steps as he went. When he got to fifteen, he stopped. 
Here's the bottom, he said. Thank goodness, I think it's a passage. Follow me down. Good went next, and I came last, carrying the basket, and on reaching the bottom lit one of the two remaining matches. By its light we could just see that we were standing in a narrow tunnel, which ran right and left at right angles to the staircase we had descended. Before we could make out any more, the match burnt my fingers and went out. Then arose the delicate question of which way to go. Of course, it was impossible to know what the tunnel was or where it led to, and yet to turn one way might lead us to safety and the other to destruction. We were utterly perplexed, till suddenly it struck good that when I had lit the match, the draft of the passage blew the flame to the left. Let us go against the draft, he said. Air draws inwards, not outwards. We took this suggestion, and feeling along the wall with our hands, whilst trying the ground before us at every step, we departed from that accursed treasure chamber on our terrible quest for life. If ever it should be entered again by living man, which I do not think probable, he will find tokens of our visit in the open chests of jewels, the empty lamp, and the white bones of poor Fulata. When we had groped our way for about a quarter of an hour along the passage, suddenly it took a sharp turn, or else was bisected by another, which we followed only in course of time to be led into a third. And so it went on for some hours. We seemed to be in a stone labyrinth that led nowhere. What all these passages are, of course, I cannot say, but we thought that they must be the ancient workings of a mine, of which the various shafts and adits traveled hither and thither as the ore led them. This is the only way in which we could account for such a multitude of galleries. At length we halted, thoroughly worn out with fatigue, and with that hope deferred which maketh the heart sick, and ate up our poor remaining piece of biltong, and drank our last sup of water, for our throats were like lime kilns. It seemed to us that we had escaped death in the darkness of the treasure chamber, only to meet him in the darkness of the tunnels. As we stood, once more utterly depressed, I thought that I caught a sound, to which I call the attention of the others. It was very faint and very far off, but it was a sound, a faint murmuring sound, for the others heard it too, and no words can describe the blessedness of it after all those hours of utter awful stillness. "'By heavens, it's running water,' said Good. "'Come on!' "'Off we started again in the direction from which the faint murmur seemed to come, "'groping our way as before along the rocky walls. "'I remember that I laid down the basket full of diamonds, "'wishing to be rid of its weight, "'but on second thoughts took it up again. "'One might as well die rich as poor,' I reflected.' As we went, the sound became more and more audible, till at last it seemed quite loud in the quiet. On, yet on, now we could distinctly make out the unmistakable swirl of rushing water. And yet, how could there be running water in the bowels of the earth? Now we were quite near it, and Good, who was leading, swore that he could smell it. Go gently, Good said sir henry we must be close splash and a cry from good he had fallen in good good where are you we shouted in terrified distress to our intense relief an answer came back in a choky voice all right i've got hold of a rock strike a light to show me where you are hastily i lit the last remaining match its faint gleam discovered to us a dark mass of water running at our feet. How wide it was we could not see, but there, some way out, was the dark form of our companion 
hanging on to a projecting rock. "'Stand clear to catch me,' swung out Good. "'I must swim for it.' Then we heard a splash and a great struggle. Another minute, and he had grabbed at and caught Sir Henry's outstretched hand, and we had pulled him up high and dry into the tunnel. "'My word!' he said between his gasps. "'That was touch and go. "'If I hadn't managed to catch that rock and know how to swim, I should have been done. "'It runs like a mill race, and I could feel no bottom. "'We dared not follow the banks of the subterranean river "'for fear lest we should fall into it again in the darkness. "'So after Good had rested a while, "'and we had drunk our fill of the water, which was sweet and fresh,' and washed our faces, that needed it sadly, as well as we could, we started from the banks of this African Styx, and began to retrace our steps along the tunnel, good dripping unpleasantly in front of us. At length we came to another gallery leading to our right. "'We may as well take it,' said Sir Henry wearily. "'All roads are alike here. We can only go on till we drop. Slowly, for a long, long while, we stumbled, utterly exhausted, along this new tunnel, Sir Henry now leading the way. Again I thought of abandoning that basket, but did not. Suddenly he stopped, and we bumped up against him. Look, he whispered, is my brain going, or is that light? We stared with all our eyes, and there, yes, there, far ahead of us, was a faint, glimmering spot no larger than a cottage window pane. It was so faint that I doubt if any eyes, except those which, like ours, had for days seen nothing but blackness, could have perceived it at all. With a gasp of hope we pushed on. In five minutes there was no longer any doubt. It was a patch of faint light. A minute more, and a breath of real live air was fanning us. On we struggled. All at once the tunnel narrowed. Sir Henry went on his knees. Smaller yet it grew, till it was only the size of a large fox's earth. It was earth now, mind you, the rock had ceased. A squeeze, a struggle, and Sir Henry was out, and so was good, and so was I, dragging Fulata's basket after me. And there above us were the blessed stars, and in our nostrils was the sweet air. Then suddenly something gave, and we were all rolling over and over and over through grass and bushes and soft, wet soil. The basket caught in something, and I stopped. Sitting up, I hallooed lustily. An answering shout came from below, where Sir Henry's wild career had been checked by some level ground. I scrambled to him and found him unhurt, though breathless. Then we looked for good. A little way off, we discovered him also, hammed in a forked root. He was a good deal knocked about, but soon came to himself. We sat down together there on the grass, and the revulsion of feeling was so great that really I think we cried with joy. We had escaped from that awful dungeon, which was so near to becoming our grave. Surely some merciful power guided our footsteps to the jackal hole, for that is what it must have been at the termination of the tunnel. And see, yonder on the mountains, the dawn we had never thought to look upon again was blushing rosy red. Presently the gray light stole down the slopes, and we saw that we were at the bottom or rather nearly at the bottom, of the vast pit in front of the entrance to the cave. Now we could make out the dim forms of the three colossi who sat upon its verge. Doubtless those awful passages, along which we had wandered the live-long night, had been originally in some way connected with the great diamond mine. As for the subterranean river in the bowels of the mountain, Heaven only knows what it is, or whence it flows, or whither it goes. I, for one, 
have no anxiety to trace its course. Lighter it grew, and lighter yet. We could see each other now, and such a spectacle as we presented I have never set eyes upon before or since. Gaunt-cheeked, hollow-eyed wretches, smeared all over with dust and mud, bruised, bleeding, the long fear of imminent death yet written on our countenances, we were indeed a sight to frighten the daylight. And yet it is a solemn fact that Good's eyeglass was still fixed in Good's eye. I doubt whether he had taken it out at all. Neither the darkness, nor the plunge in the subterranean river, nor the roll down the slope, had been able to separate Good and his eyeglass. Presently we rose, feeling that our limbs would stiffen if we stopped there long, and commenced with slow and painful steps to struggle up the sloping sides of the great pit. For an hour or more we toiled steadfastly up the blue clay, dragging ourselves on by the help of the roots and grasses with which it was closed. But now I had no more thought of leaving the basket. Indeed, nothing but death should have parted us. At last it was done, and we stood by the great road on that side of the pit, which is opposite to the Colossi. At the side of the road, a hundred yards off, a fire was burning in front of some huts, and round the fire were figures. We staggered towards them, supporting one another, and halting every few paces. Presently one of the figures rose, saw us, and fell onto the ground, crying out for fear. Infarus, Infarus, it is we, thy friends. He rose. He ran to us, staring wildly, and still shaking with fear. O oh, my lords, my lords, it is you indeed. You come back from the dead, come back from the dead. And the old warrior flung himself down before us and clasping Sir Henry's knees, he wept aloud for joy. End of chapter 18